Welcome to September's Indiana Learning Partnership event, Fall into Reading. Today, Erin Moore and I will be sharing an overview of the science of reading, along with some strategies and ideas for you to take back to your own classrooms or incorporate at home with your own children. Erin, I will go ahead and turn it over to you to introduce yourself. Hello, I'm Erin Moore. I'm a training support specialist with the Indiana Literacy Cadre at Wilson Education Center. And I'm Morgan Mason. I am also a training support specialist uh, here at the Central Indiana um, Service Center. So we are supporting this, this cadre, this project. We are excited about the work that we are doing in schools uh, with our coaches. And um, we're going to start out with just a really brief video, um, kind of talking about the science of reading and giving a quick overview before we jump into our presentation. Reading. Learning is based in large part on our ability to transmit and receive information via the written word. As we understand more and more about how the brain works, the science of reading is illuminating how the brain learns to read. And it begins with the understanding that while speaking comes intuitively in human brain development, reading and writing do not. Over the years, there have been many schools of thought on the best approaches to teach learners how to read. But research has proven that while these varying approaches work for many learners, they don't work for all. And one reason is that these approaches didn't fully map to the science of how the brain actually learns to read. To understand this better, we'll need a rope. Hollis Scarborough is a leading researcher on early language development and created what's come to be known as the reading rope, which illustrates the strands of understanding and skills that weave together to form a cord of skilled reading. One core strand focuses on language comprehension, which includes background knowledge, vocabulary, language structures, verbal reasoning, and literacy knowledge. The other strand focuses on word recognition, which incorporates phonological and phonemic awareness, decoding, and sight recognition. As young learners' language comprehension skills grow, they become increasingly strategic in their understanding of sounds and meaning. And as their word recognition skills increase, they become increasingly automatic in their recognition of letter and word shapes. And as both core skills mature, they weave together to form fluent execution and coordination of word recognition and text comprehension. Scarborough's reading rope is one of the most widely used models for explaining how we learn to read. It has served as a foundation for many other models of reading as the research into the complex process of learning to read expands and evolves. By better understanding the science of reading, educators can incorporate instructional methods, routines, and classroom practices that better meet the needs of all learners. So what is the science of reading? It's a systematic, explicit way of instructing reading in the classroom. Phonics is taught sequentially and purposefully and it's a large chunk of the reading block. With the science of reading, you really wanna have rich complex text in front of all of your students in the class, um, no matter where they're at academically, getting them in front of those texts is so important. Um, multiple reads of the same text is also uh, something that's super important when um, using the science of reading. Uh, the teacher modeling a lot and then the um, moving to that student practice piece, uh, but the more familiar they are with the text and the more opportunities they have to practice with that same text, the more that it is, that it is going to be embedded in their brain. And then the other piece is high quality conversations about vocabulary, comprehension, language, and structure to deepen understanding of a text. Um, those pieces are so important when it comes to building that comprehension and um, preparing students to use some of these comprehension skills to then apply it to other texts and other things that they are reading. The first of the five pillars in the science of reading is phonemic awareness. Phonemic awareness only involves phonemes or sounds and it can be done in the dark. A phoneme is the smallest part of the spoken language. There's 44 phonemes in the English language, but only 26 letters. 
Systematic explicit instruction involves skills such as blending, segmenting, adding, deleting, or substituting sounds. So let's try a couple examples you can take back to your classroom. The first example we're going to try is blending. I'll say the sounds and you tell me the word. For example, I might say, ah, mm. The students would then repeat, ah, mm, and they would blend those sounds to say the word fan. Let's try a segmenting example as well. I'll say the word, you tell me the sounds. So I might say something like sit. Then the students would reply sit, and then they would segment those sounds, s-i-t, sit. The second pillar is phonics. And phonics is a relationship between the letters, the graphemes, and the sounds, the phonemes that are in the English language. These phonics skills are really important because students use them to decode unfamiliar words. The instruction is done in a systematic and a explicit structured approach. And this is important because when students uh, attempt to decode words themselves, it helps them to form one strong neural pathway rather than guessing and checking, which forms multiple weak pathways instead. So if we were to try this in the classroom, um, you would want to use a decodable reader that focused on the skill that was taught in whole group instruction. So for example, if you are working on short A, whole group, that would be in your phonemic awareness pillar, that would be in your phonics pillar. And then your decodable reader focuses on that skill as well. Um, remembering that you will want multiple reads of this decodable text and um, teacher modeling is going to be really important all of which happens before students are asked to decode and read this independently. All right, so then the third pillar within this, um, the five pillars of the science of reading is fluency. So fluency is the ability to recognize words easily, read with greater speed, accuracy, and expression, and to better understand what is read. So fluency in oral reading includes a couple of different things. Accuracy, which is reading with few errors, reading speed, which is the rate at which a student reads, slow or fast, and then prosody, which is the skill of reading aloud with proper intonation, phrasing, and expression. So once a student has kind of mastered all of those things, that's when they are considered to be a fluent reader. So practicing some of those things um, in the classroom, one thing that you could do as a classroom teacher or at home with your students to try some of these things is ask students to prepare a reading of a piece that le leads itself to a performance, like a poem or a play. Um, performing something requires students to rehearse it, to practice it, and to really um, do multiple readings of the text so that it feels like they are performing for an audience. Um, it invites students to infuse the reading with expression um, because just like if you were to watch a play or um, see somebody act out something, they're doing all of that with fluency. Um, so that's a great way to have students practicing that skill um, with texts that they read. The fourth pillar is vocabulary. Now I could go on and on about vocabulary. There are so many different um, things that go into this vocabulary piece, but I'm just gonna break it down and kind of give you an overview of the two types of vocabulary embedded in this pillar. So there are two types of vocabulary, oral and print. A reader who encounters a strange word in print can decode that word um, to speech using their, the skills of their phonics skills, their phonemic awareness skills. And if it's in their vocabulary, the reader will be able to understand it. If the, reader, if the word is not in the reader's oral vocabulary, then the reader would have to determine the meaning by other means possible. So that's where the teacher comes in, exposing them to a variety of strategies that they could use to learn that word or to figure out what that word means is going to help them then better understand what they're reading and the words um, that are in a text. 
So consequently, the larger the reader's vocabulary, either oral or print, the easier it is to make sense of a text. So using all of that information, the teacher can then make sure that she is exposing her students to as many strategies as possible to build up that student's vocabulary. So one example that I think is um, a great thing to try in the classroom, I especially think this is important um, as I was researching and reading about this uh, for students that are um, second language learners. Um, students can explore multiple meanings of a word using a simple bubble map. So if you think about it, there are quite a few words in the English language that have multiple meaning, meanings. And if I'm a student or if I'm um, someone learning the language for the first time, that could be really confusing. So exposing them to this bubble map um, and teaching them this strategy, uh, what you do is you would put the word in the middle of the map and then around the center of it, you would explain the different meanings or examples of the word um, that should be added. So um, for example, the word bat. So we have the animal bat, and then we have a baseball bat. Um, so exposing them to those different meanings is going to help them build their vocabulary, both um, orally and in print, um, by exposing them to those, those different things. So that's one strategy. Like I said, there are a ton of strategies that we could use um, for vocabulary that, and that are out there that support the science of reading, but uh, that's just one that I thought was really powerful. And then the fifth pillar, the last pillar is comprehension. And with all of the other four pillars, the goal is to get to this place, to get to a place where reading comprehension is something that a student feels successful in. So reading comprehension is the ability to read a text, process it, and then understand what it means. So it relies on two interconnected abilities, which again, I'll go back into these other pillars, um, word reading. So being able to decode the symbols on the page, and then language comprehension, which is being able to understand the meaning of the words and sentences. So without being able to do both of those things, a reader is not going to be able to comprehend a text. So that is why the other four pillars and that foundation is so important in order to get to this fifth pillar, which is comprehension. So again, there are so many different comprehension strategies that I could share, but one that I think is really powerful and um, really shows a deep level of comprehension is when a reader uses um, what they've read to actually create something new. So for example, maybe they've read a story, maybe they've read it a couple times, they are very familiar with it, and then they're going to take that story and rewrite it, changing the characters or the setting. So they're using their knowledge of the text, their comprehension and their ability to understand kind of what happened in that story, and then making changes to create a new story using the same characters or setting. And the example that I kept thinking of as I um, was preparing for this is how many versions of the three little pigs I have seen out there. So my first grade teacher brain um, immediately went to that. And uh, that would be a great way to challenge my students like, hey, we've read this version of the three little pigs. Now, how can we take that understanding of the text and make some tweaks to make our own version of the story? So. That was a very quick overview of the science of reading, but um, I know that Erin and I have really enjoyed our training this summer, um, learning about the science of reading, talking to our coaches and principals about these ideas and embedding it into the schools and the classrooms that we are serving. Um, I'm excited to continue to learn more. Erin, uh, is there anything else that you want to add before I close us out? I don't think so. All right. Well, we appreciate you all joining us today. And if you are not familiar with the science of reading, I would definitely look into it. Um, there are tons of resources out there, podcasts, books, all, all of the above, um, but definitely something to look into. And we hope to see you back next time. Thanks for joining us. Thanks.